He is an angry Asian, and I feel like that's the true representation I need. spur in the moment video because I did not realize it was time for the mid-year freak out tag until literally this morning when I woke up. If you don't know, the mid-year freak out tag is basically like a check-in where you look back on the books that you've read and then you also look forward to the books that you have yet to read for the remainder of the year. Even though time is a social construct, it's still nice to check in during the middle of the year. I feel that way not just about books but also for other stuff in my life like my mental health and my goals that I had during the year and where I'm at now. If you feel as similar as I do about that, then you might be really interested in Fabulous, the number one self-care app to help build better habits and achieve your goals, as well as the sponsor of today's video. This app is basically a digital coach. You could also view it as your happiness trainer. They use insights from behavioral science to help you build habits to ensure you to live the life that you want. I have always struggled with time management because I oversleep all the time. Then I end up scrambling to try to be productive in the limited hours of the day when I could have just enjoyed my morning if I had built a routine. What I like about this app is that it's much gentler compared to other kinds of apps that are similar to this. It's 100% personalized. There's two approaches that you can do. You can do the habit tracking or you can do dedicated programs. So with habit tracking, you can pick hundreds of recommended habits or create your own. Then they send you timely reminders and other features using the behavioral science to help you build it up. Or you can do a dedicated program where you get to choose a journey to immerse yourself in. It's like your own personal adventure over several weeks and they help you navigate throughout the whole thing. If you like to build your daily routine, the first 100 people who click on my link in the description will get 25% off of their fabulous description. All right, now let's dive into the video. Usually I do a cook and book kind of series where I cook while I talk about books. However, since this is a very spur in the moment thing, I wasn't able to plan this ahead of time. I actually cooked already last night. I'm back on my HelloFresh bullshit again. So I made this ground beef pasta. They gave me a shit ton of Mexican cheese to sprinkle on top. I'm so glad I'm not lactose intolerant like the rest of my Asian friends because I would blow up this toilet. Instead, I'm just gonna enjoy all my leftovers. This is gonna be more of an eat and read kind of situation. Let's just eat our meals and chat about books and have a cozy fun time. So far, as of filming this, I have read 31 books this year. Although keep in mind that three of them were graphic novels and two of them were super short books. First question asks, what is the best book that you've read so far this year? I'm gonna go with notes on the execution because you know me, I'm a literary hoe. It's about a serial killer who is currently on death row, but it's told primarily through the perspectives of three women in his life. I feel like it gives such an interesting discussion when it comes to the death penalty and whether a bad person is deserving of redemption whether a bad person could have been a good person. And I like that this novel doesn't give a straightforward answer. That is the plus side of having different perspectives. Some people might sympathize for him and then some people might not give a shit whether he was worthy of redemption or not because the point is he still killed all those women. And I really like that because I hate being spoon fed See what I did there? Spoon fed a message or a soapbox from the author when I'm reading a book. I like that this book allows you to make your own judgments or come away with even more questions to think about. It doesn't tell you how you should think, but it makes you think. The next question asks, the best sequel you've read so far? The only sequel that I technically read this year was volume two of Heartstopper. It's a graphic novel series that you probably know about by now because I reacted to the entire Netflix adaptation and my my partner has all of the volumes, so we decided to read it together. It was my first time reading it. I only read the first two volumes because that's what the TV show covered, and I didn't want to be spoiled for a season two. I'll go more into my thoughts in my monthly wrap up. I will say that I do think it was an improvement from the first one because part of what I really liked from watching Heartstopper was seeing one of the main characters realize that he's not straight. It just resonates on a personal level to me because that's something that I realized last year as well. So it's nice to see that mirrored, except instead of a bitchy Asian girl, I see it in a sweet ginger boy. Actually, he's not ginger. He's blonde in the comics, but I stand by my true 
proof that he is ginger in the Netflix adaptation. So I love that journey for him and I liked that we got to focus on that in the sequel. Next question is new release you haven't read yet but you want to. So I just pulled out this arc that I received, Our Wives Under the Sea. This was one of my anticipated books for the year. I didn't expect it to be so short. The main character has a wife who has recently returned from a deep sea mission that ended in catastrophe. Her wife has not been the same ever since her return and now they're struggling to form a normal life again. And I think the main character is also having to grapple with the fact that her wife is no longer the same person that she had known when they got together. I actually don't know what to expect from this book but I do want to read it soon and I will let you know what I think about it when I get to it. Number four is most anticipated release for the second half of the year. I don't know what books are coming out in the second half of the year so I'm gonna change this to just whatever book that was released this year. One book that just did not make it on my radar until recently when I was just browsing bookstores and I saw it is Gallant by V.E. Schwab. This already came out in March of 2022. For some reason, I haven't heard anything about it since it came out. And the rating on Goodreads is a little bit lower. It's like 3.88, which is lower than what I've seen most of her other books. So I don't know if it's actually good or not. But when I was in the bookstore and I flipped through the novel, I still wanted to read it anyway, because regardless of what the story is, I think V.E. Schwab is a good writer. And sometimes I just like to read books that have good writing, even if the story isn't exactly what I prefer. From what I gleaned of the synopsis, it's about the main character having to go home to Gallant. I don't know what it is, maybe a British thing or something. I don't know. My only form of British knowledge is through Heartstopper. Is it a house? Is it a piece of land? I don't know. There's a giant manor, but it's crumbling. And there's supposed to be all these mysterious secrets that the main character is going to find out about her family and previous generations. And it'll probably make sense of whatever mommy issues she had because she lost her mom a while back. I think it's a little bit of like a dark fantasy because the main character does see ghouls around the hallways. I'm assuming she's the only one who sees it. So it's really nice that the main character recognizes me. I'll try to read it this year and update you on a better worded synopsis and what I think about it. Next question is biggest disappointment. I'm gonna go with a book that I did not finish this year even though it was one of the books I was looking forward to reading and that is The Paris Apartment. It's a thriller book about this broke girl who needs a fresh start so she goes to Paris where her half brother is living so that she can come crash with him but for some reason when she shows up at his apartment he's not there all the neighbors in that apartment are weird as hell so the longer that he's been missing the more suspicious it starts to get that maybe there's like a bigger plot at play and maybe her brother was into some sketchy shit so it kind of becomes like a mystery where every neighbor in his apartment is essentially a suspect and whatever they're telling the main character is probably not the whole story I really wanted to read this book because I had heard good things about the author's previous book. It was called The Hunting Party. I remember flipping through it in a bookstore and thinking that the writing seemed pretty good. So I decided to try out The Paris Apartment since that's a newer release, but I ended up dropping it around 100 pages because the writing was not hitting the way that I wish it was hitting. Well, I don't know if the quality of her writing that I was reading or skimming in The Hunting Party was just a mirage that I made up, but I was not a fan of the writing in The Paris Apartment. It just wasn't giving any flavor. I wasn't really interested in what was going on in the story either. And I feel like when you're reading a thriller, you should at least be intrigued by the mystery. The next question is a biggest surprise. I'm gonna go with House of Hollow because I did not expect to love it as much as I did. I feel like I get very picky with young adult books and it's very rare for me to like young adult contemporary books. So I really came in expecting this to be three stars, but from the moment I read read it. I just loved the writing, the atmosphere, the eeriness. So it follows these sisters who are weird as hell because when they were children, they mysteriously disappeared. It was like they got kidnapped, but there was no perpetrator to like pin this onto. They just disappeared out of thin air. And then when the sisters came back, no one knows how they came back either. So their reappearance was as mysterious as their disappearance. Ever since they came back, they've been weird as hell. They've lost their memories. So they don't even know what happened. They all have this identical half moon scar at their throat. They seem to have mysterious powers, like they're able to influence other people to do stuff, even if it's against their will. Like this one time when one of the main characters was getting bullied, one of the other sisters was able to influence the bully to cut her hair in front of everyone at 
at the school. They're also getting paler and have white hair. So it's creepy, but it's also kind of like an aesthetic too. I know all the creepy occult bitches on Tumblr would love this shit. So the story begins when the oldest sister disappears again. And ever since then, there's these horned men that start following the main character and the other sister. They find a corpse that falls from the older sister's ceiling. They try to follow the older sister's footsteps to figure out where she went missing. But along the way, they start to discover what really happened when they disappeared when they were children. I read this book in two days. It kind of gives the vibes of a fairy tale horror because everything is gross and disgusting, but it describes it in such a way that seems like an aesthetic. I really liked the combination of creepy and feminine. The author just did such a good job at bringing the exact kind of vibes that she was going for in this book that I thoroughly enjoyed the writing and that's my biggest surprise because I did not expect it. I thought it was gonna be another basic bitch young adult book that would rate three stars and now here we are. Pleasantly surprised. The next question is favorite new author. I don't really have favorite authors but I'm noticing this year that I've been reading a lot of books by Nina LaCour. The first book I ever read by her was We Are Okay. This was a book about a college student who decides to stay on campus while everyone else goes on winter break to see their family for the holidays. And that book did such a great job at conveying the loneliness that you feel when you don't have that familial connection during a holiday break when all your friends are gone. Like you can't even spend time with your friends because they got families and they probably have functional childhoods and you're just like, well, guess I'll be alone with my trauma during the holidays. So it was very specific to me. And this year I read Watch Over Me, which is her newer young adult book. Even though it didn't hit the same as We Are Okay, I still liked it anyway. And then I noticed this trend that Nina LaCour has, which is that she has very sparse writing, but it's sparse in a way that I feel like is effective. And it made me realize that so many other authors tend to overwrite. And that's why you have these big bulky books where they try to shove every description possible because they think that purple prose means they're better writers. And when I read Nina LaCour, who has such short novels, but they're still good, it makes me realize that sometimes less is more. I am currently reading her adult book now, Yerba Buena. Unfortunately, this is probably gonna be a three star read for me. And I'll talk more about that in my monthly wrap up. So not every book is a hit, but I do think that this is probably gonna be an author where with each new book that comes out, I'll check it out anyway, because I do think there is that unique quality of brevity in her writing. The next question is newest fictional crush. I don't get fictional crushes, but to answer this question, I had to look through all of the books I read so far and figure out which character I would be willing to date. I have chosen the main guy from The Proposal. Out of everyone I read so far, he seems to be the most stable man and is therefore a good love interest because men who are stable, <laughs> It's such a rarity. First of all, the guy is a doctor, so he making money. Even if I don't care for him, doctors have such long hours, I don't even have to see the fool. He's also respectful to women, another rare quality that you see in men. There are several scenes where he cooks for himself and for the main character. When the main character visits his apartment, his swanky, nice apartment, by the way, because he got that doctor money to afford it, she sees how clean the apartment is because he regularly cleans up after himself, which is another rare quality in straight cis men. So even though the book in general was a little bit too vanilla, for my taste, it's exactly the kind of vanilla that I would want in my real life. I like drama and fiction, but I don't want drama in real life. The next question is your newest favorite character. I'm choosing Tao from Heartstopper. He was the main character's best friend. He's technically a book character. However, he barely shows up in the Heartstopper graphic novels. So this is cheating a little bit because it's based on his character in the Netflix adaptation. I... I love how the annoying person that was revving their motorcycle for half of my video now finally decides to leave now that I'm towards the end of my video. Tao became my favorite character from that book to screen adaptation because he is an angry Asian and I feel like that's the true representation I need. I don't need any drama with immigrant parents or grappling with the diaspora or some bullshit like that. I need someone to be just pissed off over 
nothing. Every time something happens, I would always think, Tao is gonna make such a big fucking deal out of this because he's so extra like that. He's doing too much, but yet there's this endearing quality to it. I think that's where we're different because when I'm angry and pissed off and bitchy, it's not endearing. I appreciate that he has no chill. He's like an angry chihuahua. He truly is a friend who's ride or die for you. But if you also don't ride for him in return, then he's like, fuck you, and he'll make a whole tantrum about it. I feel like I would be exhausted to be his friend, but I like watching him because he's fucking funny. The next question is a book that made you cry. I have not cried reading any book this year, so I'm gonna choose the saddest book that I read. That is a book that is ironically titled Don't Cry For Me. It's about a black father who makes amends with his gay son through a series of letters that he writes on his deathbed. So the entire book is through the form of his letters. Not only is the letter an apology to him, but it's also a letter that gives some context for the way that he grew up. Basically dealing what it's like to be a black man in rural Arkansas. If I were the son, I'd be like, damn dad, not you trauma dumping on me. But that's why the book is gonna be the answer for this question. It's basically trauma dumping. It just made me reflect on how a lot of older generations that are a bit more close-minded, they've been through a lot of shit and it doesn't necessarily justify them being assholes to their children, but it can provide context because you learn about their upbringing and how cultures have influenced their beliefs and how a lot of times, especially when it comes to older generations of black people or people of color, their lives were dedicated to just trying to survive. But I think things like figuring out your sexuality or dealing with depression and not being happy, these are things that I feel like weren't even considered to older generations who were just trying to survive. And I feel like that's where the discrepancy comes from, where now this kind of person who's lived that kind of life sees a younger generation that's dealing with its own different set of problems that they can't relate to. Wanting happiness for yourself is isn't something that certain generations are used to wanting. I think what's also sad is not knowing whether the son will respond to the father or not, or if the son has even read the letters. Because again, you're reading all of this through the perspective of the dad who's dying. I think that lack of closure is also part of like the sad aspect of the book. Conversely, the next question is a book that made you happy. I don't know if there is like a specific book that made me happy, but closest I could answer to that would be Acrocorn Cove. This is a graphic novel that I can talk about in my next monthly wrap up. I can see it as a comfort read and I'm sure that's obvious from the pastel art. It's about a little girl and her father who return to a seaside hometown. There she discovers a colony of acrocorns, which are these creatures who live in the coral reefs. They kind of look like seahorses. They're very cute. And a lot of the book is about ocean preservation and not being being like a shitty human being and treating the ocean like trash. Despite the book having a real life problem, I think because it's aimed towards like a younger audience and has such cute artwork, it makes it more of like a gentle hug or a gentle reminder to tell you, hey, don't be a shitty human being. You gotta be kind to mother nature. And I think that kind of cozy, gentle vibe that the book has would be the closest answer to that question. The next question is most beautiful book that you have bought or received. I I do not buy books. However, for the sake of being less redundant, I will whip out a brand new book that I have not talked about on my channel. It's a book that I almost bought. I was very tempted to do it, but then I did my taxes and I realized that I actually don't make that much money. So it ended up not happening. That book is called A Vast Pointless Gyration of Radioactive Rocks and Gas in Which You Happen to Occur. This book was sold in the promotion of the movie Everything Everywhere All at Once. It is a very pretty book that compiles a bunch of short stories and illustrations that cover multiverse theories since that is a large theme of the movie. It is such a pretty book both on the outside and on the inside because there are these gorgeous illustrations, a lot of trippy visuals, but that shit was $52. I don't fucking think so. And that's not even including shipping. I don't even want to think about that. But damn is it pretty. So if any of you have more disposable income than I do, 
maybe it's worth checking it out for you. And then the last question is, what books do you want to read by the end of the year? I definitely want to read Book Lovers by Emily Henry. I'm currently listening to it on audiobook right now. It's a romance book that kind of plays around with the tropes of the romance stories you often see where there's like this bitchy workaholic character that goes to a small town and then they meet someone, usually a rugged lumberjack or something like that, who makes them realize that capitalism is awful and they try to save the town from being bought by evil billionaires or some shit like that. Anyway, they fall in love. Typical romance bullshit. And usually in those stories, there's also the bitchy other woman who tries to convince the main guy character to stay in the big city and demolish the bakery of the small town or something like that. Like she doesn't get it because she's too pro-capitalism. The main character is actually that archetype of the woman who keeps like being dumped by her boyfriend because he's fallen for the baker of the small town. <laughs> and I really like that we're finally focusing on a character like that because I always wondered, what about the other woman? She's always getting crapped on. Just cause she can't bake cookies? What kind of reverse sexism is this? I also really want to read more young adult fantasy. So I want to try reading all the stars and teeth. The only thing I know is that it's about a princess who's forced to flee and she has to make a deal with a pirate. I also want to check out a far wilder magic. The only thing I know about it is that it takes place in a world where there's these mythical creatures. There's like this whole hunt that's organized to take these creatures. And so the main character really wants the money that is the winning prize for that hunt. And in order to participate in the hunt, she has to register in a team of two. I just like stories where two unlikely allies must come together and maybe fall in love? Question mark? I don't know. That is pretty much the end of the tag. I have finished my food. Go ahead and unsubscribe from my channel and goodbye. Ain't no thing to do my thing, it's what I did the best yes, I cop that crib and bought two chains and then I hid the rest yes, And it's okay to do your thing, but just don't do the most uh -huh. I put my friends in that old Benz and took that to the coast yes,